The War of Venetia had just ended and the Empire was already in full swing, with its army and navy being built up in a record time. Peace between races was also at a record high. Every race pitched in to build the Empire up from the orcs in the Badlands to the elves in the mountains. Everyone played their part. A new trading system was started because this newfound alliance between races creating a massive stream of merchant ships making their way back and forth from the smoldering islands to the mainland's coast. These merchant ships were ripe with valuable materials as well as new imperial currency which attracted pirates like moths to a flame. Pirate vessels like the White Widow ravaged the seas, disrupting and sometimes completely cutting off trade for Asia. Although the Empire had a massive fleet, it was no match for the, the sheer number of pirate gangs that outnumbered them 3 to 1. It was estimated that by 4,899, there were an estimated of 3,100 pirate vessels stocking the seas around Wardenjo, with the Imperial fleet altogether only being about 1,000. A meeting was called at Regul, the capital of the Empire, to discuss the matter, it was very heated to say the least. The Dwarf Underking wouldn't agree with the Elf Chancellor because of the whole stranding them on the volcanic island incident. The Elf Chancellor wanted to stop all trade of the Smoldering Isles until the problem was solved. The Lingering Alpha wanted to parlay with the pirates in the hopes of getting some of the treasure and the Orc Rashra just wanted to murder them for this to strike fear into anyone thinking of taking up piracy. The Chorus Queen did not have an opinion because she was secretly offering the pirates safety in exchange for a cut of the Imperium. If anyone disagreed or screwed her over, she would make sure the ocean itself small. The human emperor at the time, Gregory Randolph, had a better solution to the pirate problem. The incredible number of pirates was too much to just charge in the head, even with every faction's support. Knowing this, Randolph devised a clever tactic. The pardoning of all pirates. This blew the pirates' minds because they thought once you start a life of crime, it was a one-way trip. There was no way out. The plan was to cut the number of pirates in half and get back most of the stolen loot in exchange for, the, in exchange for their freedom and a small amount of their treasure. Over the next five years, an estimated 2,500 pirates turned their weapons and ships to rejoin society despite recent protests by law-abiding citizens. Most of the holdouts were hunted down by the Langrand captain, Merrick Nallows, on his ship, the Bloodhound. The rest of them were camped out on a small, small archipelago in between the Smoldering Isles and the Orcish Badlands, the Bolonian Isles. The Bolonians were used as a hub for pirates and criminals for decades, and Merrick was finally going to drive every last one of them out permanently. He thought, if he could get a foothold there, the pirate menace would finally be over. So, in the year 4907, the Blood Hound, along with an escort of an estimated eight flagships and two smaller ships under the cover of night, attacked the remaining 463 pirates who were mainly held up on the island of Nako, with two flagships and four smaller ships. The battle that ensued was one of the bloodiest imperial history, in a lot of ways, it's equivalent. The Bloodhound and three other ships landed on the east side of the island, while the rest distracted the pirates still in open water trying to escape. They stopped just off the coast of the island and started for shore in rowboats. So far, no one saw the incoming invasion force, but eventually when one pirate went to use the John, he saw the attack force and sounded the alarm by ringing a bell. Despite the Imperials' overwhelming advantage, the whole island was rigged with traps and vantage points just in case something like this were to happen, making the trip up the beach to the pirate town very difficult. The Imperial army of around 700 was being decimated by landmines, spike pits, and a volley of arrows coming from on top of a large hill where the shanty town was located. The evasion force tried desperately to coordinate, putting their sheets together to form a makeshift barricade. While also being a good sailor, 
Merrick was also a very excellent shot and sniped off a total of 56 pirates with this custom crossbow. The army eventually made it up the beachhead with only 169 casualties and was met and was met with the town's makeshift fortifications consisting of 12 foot tall wooden walls, two archer towers in the front and two in the back, and a few cannons raining down from further up the hilltop. Merrick ordered the army to push through as fast as they could up to the main gate. Therefore, they would be under the archer towers and blocked from cannon fire. One thing he didn't account for was a sneak attack coming up from the palm trees. Pirates waited for the army to, to walk close enough to the main gate before letting loose arrows from behind. This defense was more than Merrick bargained for and his troops were completely surrounded. In a word, he was screwed. Then out of the corner of Merrick's eye, he saw that the wall didn't close off the young lumber yard, which was filled with many round uncut logs. Without thinking for another second, he grabbed seven of the closest troops and made a daring run across a quarter mile to pick up one of the logs. They then carried all the way back to the main gate and used it as a makeshift battering ram, while the remaining troops held their shields to block oncoming fire. Eventually the gate broke open and the Imperial Army of now 348 flooded the town to take revenge for their fallen companions. Merrick used a torch to light the log on fire and roll into the main square, setting a good portion of the house ablaze. After only 30 minutes, the advancing Imperial Army took 75% of the town. The shanty town was divided into three districts, the outer perimeter, outside the town walls, the inner district, which included most of the town, and the docking district, which was directly connected to the captain's mansion. The mansion is in quotations because the mansion is basically a ship that was cut in half and used as a house. The hill the town is on is also an arched rock with half the ship sticking out on the other side, containing a set of stairs going down to the docks on the opposite side of the bend beachhead. It sounds really complicated when it read, but I can assure you it's much more simple than it may seem. The rain pirates were cornered in the captain's mansion as the invading force gains more and more momentum, forcing them to take drastic action. Langren pirate captain known as Jonathan Python Pierce, dear, due to his rare birth defect, his eyeballs are snake-like in appearance, giving him the nickname Python, rallied his crew in the captain's mansion for one last defense. Meanwhile, in the Bay of Knolls, the other Imperial ships were fighting the incoming pirate armada led by the infa infamous White Widow and the Spearhead flagships. The pirates ravaged the Imperials, decimating their ranks with not only skilled combat and maneuvering, but a terrifying typhoon summoned by the elven warlock Elysia Anan aboard the Spearhead. The Imperials eventually gained the advantage once they took over the White Widow and finally executed the deadly Hell Harlot. Tommy Turncoat and his crew cowardly fled the battle with their tails between their legs, stripping the pirate armada of any flagship support. The remaining smaller pirate ships surrounded and their crew were promptly taken to prison. The Nako siege, meanwhile, was currently reaching its bloody end with the remaining pirates being pulled in the captain mansion and the imperial forces closing in to take no prisoners. 